Welcome to the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. I'm Rob Corzine, and this is Letters from Home, our daily reflection on the scripture readings from the Mass. If you haven't done it yet, just take a second right now and hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and maybe later, after we're done, go and tell a friend about us. Today is Tuesday of the 16th week of Ordinary Time. Once again, as last week, it's the memorial of another biblical saint in the Roman martyrology, St. Joseph Barsabas, who was also called Justice. This St. Joseph was one toin cost away from being listed among the Twelve Apostles. In Acts chapter 1, when the whole church is gathered together in the upper room in Jerusalem with Mary, this would be after the ascension but before the descent of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, Peter rises, speaks of the betrayal of Judas and how they should replace him. And he said, One of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from, one, uh, from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. The apostles put two men forward, Matthias, who became the twelfth apostle, and the saint we remember today, Joseph Barsabas, who was also called Justice. The name Justice uh, or Righteousness was not that uncommon among the Jews and proselytes living in the Greco-Roman world. It implies a certain obedience and devotion to the Jewish law. It's the kind of name other people give you. You don't go around calling yourself Justice. I'm Rob the Just. But that's the saint for today, a close disciple of Jesus, St. Joseph Barsabas, pray for us. So let's turn now to the readings for today. The first reading for today is again a big deal. It's the story of the Israelites crossing the Red Sea in Exodus 14. It's such a pivotal moment in salvation history that we read it every year at the Easter Vigil, right? Like the big deal liturgy of the year where it's the third reading. And once again, I'm going to pass over it and charge right to the gospel reading. Because today, we have Matthew 12, verses 46 to 50. This is in the middle, at the turning point of what scholars call book three in the Gospel of Matthew. I think a few weeks ago, we talked about how Matthew has got these infancy narratives at the front. You've got the Passion Week at the end, and in between, it's five books that are structured as narrative discourse, narrative discourse. This is the end of the third book's narrative. And tomorrow, we'll begin reading the discourse. In this case, Jesus' parables of the kingdom. Chapter 12 up to now has had a kind of a dark tone. It's filled with conflict and dire apocalyptic warnings. And now it turns a little brighter as Jesus provides some positive teaching on discipleship, which is a contrast to the Pharisees' rejection of Jesus. But the form that teaching takes can be a little awkward at first, for at least for us, for Catholics and Orthodox Christians. Many of our Protestant brothers and sisters see this passage as directly contradicting one of the Marian dogmas and also as downplaying the importance of Mary for Christians. But let's just read it. This is chapter, again, uh, chapter 12, verses 46 to 50. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brethren. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So first we have that word outside, right? Your your mother and your brethren are outside. It kind of seems to mark um, a distance. He's there at some remove from him. And then when he hears that they're asking for him, Jesus doesn't you know, say, sorry, folks, I need to like run outside. These are very important people to me. I got to go. Instead, we see he stretches out his hand toward his disciples and he says, here are my mother and my brethren. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now, what's really going on here is that Jesus is emphasizing the nature of discipleship. It's not in the first instance a question of blood relationship. It's not even a question of giving the assent of faith. Disciples are those who are with Jesus and those who do the will of his heavenly Father. It's them that constitute the true Christian family. 
but it does raise questions for some of our traditional beliefs about Mary, namely her exalted status amongst Christians, and more particularly, her perpetual virginity. This is currently an area of disagreement between most Protestants and the historic Christian churches, Catholics, Orthodox, and the Oriental churches. But it didn't used to be. For the first couple centuries of Protestantism, they too confessed Mary's perpetual virginity. You find that, or you see evidence of it, in their confessional statements. That changed with the advent of modern biblical studies that called a lot of things about the faith into question. But let's deal with both of those. First, uh, the easy one. Does this standard in any way denigrate Mary? No. Mary is Jesus' mother in the order of nature, but also preeminently so by this standard, right? If, if the, my mother and sister and brother, if, if my family are those who do the will of my Father in heaven, Mary is the very model of the Christian disciple who does the will of the Father in heaven. Almost the first thing we hear of her in the pages of the New Testament is her fiat, right? Fiat mihi secundum verbum tuit. Be, be done unto me according to to thy word. But it does seem at first as though the reference to the brothers of Jesus calls into question the church's belief in Mary's perpetual virginity. The New Testament mentions the brothers of Jesus in all four gospels, as well as once in Acts and once in the letter to the Galatians. Mark, uh, Mark 6, even adds some sisters. Now, I, as a growing up Protestant, growing up a Baptist, thought this was a slam dunk against the church. Like, how could you be so dumb? You never read your Bibles. Right there in the New Testament, it says Jesus had brothers. So Mary couldn't have been a virgin. But the church has always understood these so-called brethren of Jesus to be Jesus's relatives, but not children of Mary. And if you look closer at sacred scripture, I think that is the most natural and satisfying uh, interpretation. So there are four observations that support this um, unbroken tradition of the church of understanding uh, the Bible in this way. First, number one, the brethren of Jesus are never called the children of Mary, although Jesus himself is described in John chapter 2, in John chapter 19, and in Acts 1 as the son of Mary. Two, in most instances, the brethren are not named, but two of those whose names are mentioned, James and Joseph, are explicitly identified as sons of a different Mary. So we see that in Matthew 27, 56 and in Mark 15, 40. That was the answer that St. Jerome provided uh, when this was brought against the, the church by a guy named Helvidius. In his Against Helvidius, Jerome uh yeah, notes the the named brothers of Jesus who are, are of a different Mary. Uh, there is another answer, though, and Jerome just kind of swats, rudely swats away uh, the other answer that was suggested in the ancient church. It was suggested in a document called the Proto-Evangelium, or the First Gospel of James. It was widely read and copied in the early church, and it does seem to contain some real history along with a lot of legendary material. It's what you might call gospel fan fiction. Uh, The solution for the writer or writers of the Proto-Evangelium was that Joseph was much older than Mary, married Mary as a kind of protector, and that he was a widower with children from his first marriage. Now, I want to be a lot more polite about it than St. Jerome, but I don't buy that either. Uh, I think Jerome uh, is much better in reading the Gospels together and seeing if uh, you know, if these other named uh, brethren of Jesus have a different Mary, that probably applies as well to the unnamed uh, brethren and the sisters of Jesus. The third point, in John 19, we see Jesus speaking from the cross and trusts his mother to the care of the Apostle John. Uh, now, there is no mention of brothers here, but there should be If he had blood brothers, if Mary had other children, other sons in particular, it would be not only extremely unlikely that Jesus would do this, but it would be kind of an insult to him. If she had other natural sons to care for her, Jesus wouldn't need to and shouldn't be entrusting her to the Apostle John. Fourth, um, what do we do to the the plain sense of brethren? Because the Greek word there, adelphoi, 
just simply does mean brother or brethren. But in scripture, it has a much broader meaning than simple blood brothers. In ancient Hebrew, you've got no word for a lot of the various relations, um, like cousins and uncles and second cousins twice removed. And so it was customary to just use that word, brethren, in the Bible for relationships other than blood brothers. We see this um, when nobody's got any notion to defend Mary, right? As they're translating the Old Testament into Greek, that word Adelphos can be uh, a nearly related cousin, as in 1 Chronicles 23, or a more remote kinsman, as in Deuteronomy 23 and 2 Kings 10, or, or an uncle or a nephew. So in Genesis 13 and 14, Lot is described as Abraham's brother, even though we know he's actually his nephew. It's even used of those who are not blood relations at all, but are bound by a covenant. So in 2 Samuel 1 and in 1 Samuel 18, we have men described as brothers, even though they're not even blood relations. The New Testament continues this Old Testament tradition. So you often see brother Adelphos or brethren Adelphoi used in this wider sense. Paul uses it as a synonym for uh, his Israelite kinsmen. So uh, all is Israel are brothers uh, in his words in Romans 9. And it also denotes completely biologically unrelated Christians in the new covenant family of God. So in Romans 8 and 12 in Colossians 1, in Hebrews 2, in James 1, the, the Christians, the fellow baptized are brothers. And so, for my Protestant brothers and sisters, see what I did there? This really shouldn't be a point of contention between us. And it wasn't in the early era of Protestantism. The biblical evidence, I think, is convincing on its own. And it wasn't until the modern era, not a great age of faith, that anyone questioned it. Also, it's not a slippery slope. I think you should go on to embrace the other Marian dogmas. But it isn't as though you're on the short road to Rome if you'd embrace this one biblical perspective. Now, I've used up most of my time on that one point of apologetics, but I want to go back and, um, and look at what Jesus is actually teaching here today. The real point of this is not the negative one, right, that he's not denouncing his mother. The real point is... Um, you know, what does it take to be the disciple of Jesus, to be with Jesus, and to be his brother, his sister, his mother? It's those who do the will of his Father in heaven. And so let's pray today for the grace to be that, to be with Christ, and to always do the will of the Father in heaven. And that is all the time I do have for today. And I want to thank you once again for joining me here on the St. Paul Center's Letters from Home. Until next week, God bless and keep you today and always.